Welcome to Crosspoint. 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 An interactive program featuring ministers and leaders of the Christian community addressing the issues that are challenging the church today. Here's your host, Mark Taylor. Today here on Crosspoint, we're going to hear a story of how God used a man whose life experienced many ups and downs that eventually ended up at the Supreme Court. Coach Joe Kennedy is my guest today. This is Mark Taylor, and welcome to Crosspoint. Well, with me today here on Crosspoint, I have uh, Joe Kennedy. Joe's a football coach. He's also a a 20-year Marine veteran, and uh, he was in Bremerton, Washington. It's a high school there, varsity football. Uh, one of the coaches, and uh, he had always made a commitment to God to give thanks at the conclusion of the games. Folks, you know, in the day and time that we live, and especially in some of the more liberal places in America that we uh, get at, sometimes these things can be offensive. That's what we're going to be talking about today. He's got a book out now entitled Average Joe, but this is quite an inspirational story. A lot of things are happening because of this, so Apparently, God's hand was in this whole situation. He wanted to make some things happen, and uh, he sure did stir up things, didn't he, Coach? He sure did. (laughs) Sometimes he's ridiculous on what he does. Well, in the introduction of the book, what we've got here is you, uh, and we'll let you tell the story here in a minute, but this kind of began back around middle of 2015, early there, or maybe a little before. Your case actually ended up in the Supreme Court, which, uh, you know, they don't hear that many cases, but yours did, again, as the hand of God directed it, uh, because God wanted to point some stuff out and, and get some people's attention and show his power, and he did. So what got you in trouble in the first place, according to what people at the school said was trouble and made a problem. Yeah, so it started out with a compliment. Somebody from another school district uh, saw what we were doing after football games and called our high school principal and told them, hey, I just want to tell you what your football program is doing is pretty awesome. So they launched an investigation to you know, find out what was awesome about it, and their lawyers started getting all squishy and that's when trouble started is when the school district lawyers got involved. So you were uh, basically just going out to the middle of the field after a ball game and yourself praying if players came out there, that was up to them. You, This was just something you did on your own. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. And so, but by doing that, the, the school board, and of course, you know, there's people out there that don't like anything that refers or even looks like uh, Christianity. Uh, they just didn't appreciate that at all, and they wanted it, what, I guess, totally stopped? Yeah, at first they said, uh, they, they gave me a letter of direction that said um, I was to stop praying with the students, and I, I obliged. I, I said, okay, you know, it's unfortunate, but if your school, your rules, and I thought we were done at that point, but then they came back a week later and said, um, yeah, well, we could still see you out there on the 50-yard line praying, even though it's by myself. And that's when um, I had to take a stand because they gave me the ultimatum between my job and uh, complying with, with the school district's uh, directives. And I will choose God over anything, anytime. Okay, so this is a very great story about your entire life, actually. Uh, and looking here in the book, uh, in the introduction, uh, you were raised in church. You didn't meet God, though, you said, until you was about 14 years old. And when your parents moved away, uh, there was some situations, and it kind of got uh, where it kind of turned your heart and into some rage, I guess. And uh, you began to change a little bit, and ha- and that caused some issues, I guess. But that's kind of where your real story begins, isn't it? It is. It really is. So, yeah, you nailed it. Uh, from a really, really bad kid into uh, something that God could turn anything around. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and so as, you know, God began to work in your life, you still had other situations, too. You ended up becoming a Marine, didn't you? Yes, I was always fighting, and I was always in trouble. I knew that I needed some discipline, and I needed some focus in my life. And I thought, we're we're better place to learn all of that than in the Marines who encourage fighting. And it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And I, I just kind of took it like a duck to water and absolutely loved being in the Marine Corps. 
And so you made a career out of the Marine Corps, didn't you? And uh, then you got out of the Marine Corps and you went to uh, becoming a teacher. Is that correct? Well, I, I got out uh, of the Marine Corps and I met up with my childhood sweetheart and we got married and I started working for the government. She was working for the school district and between her and that athletic director, they're the ones that kind of got me into uh, thinking about coaching. Now, in the book, you talk about a man, I think his name was uh, Hank Scholes, and uh, that man really had a great effect upon your life, didn't he? It sure did, yeah. He, that's the guy who sowed all the seeds and just really took the time to care about me as a, as a person and cared about my, you know, eternal soul. So, yeah, that guy was the absolute lifesaver. Through all of these things that you've had to experience, was there times where you felt that God's hand was upon you and you felt like this is the right thing to do even though I don't want to do it? Oh, yeah, every single day. The, the whole entire time um, that we were going through uh, the troubles with the school district, I knew I was doing the right thing, and I've always told my players to do the right thing, even if it's not popular. And since I gave myself to God and, and made a, a covenant with him, yeah, I was holding up my end of the bargain, and I knew he would also. Well, Coach, how did, this, how did this affect the players on your team now? I mean, you're the guy that's got kind of all the, you know, talk about on, you know, going out and praying, but you did have players come out there and pray with you. So what happened to those players, you know, when you quit doing that? Did they continue to do it? Well, they wanted to come out. The school district has one policy. You cannot encourage nor discourage kids in prayer. So I had to walk that fine line of telling them, hey, I, I, I would re- – if you guys would respect me enough to let me go do this while you guys are doing the fight song, I'm going to go do my prayer. They wanted to join, and they were so supportive, and they would have done anything. Just incredible young men. They actually wanted to quit uh, playing. They wanted to put their helmets on the football field and walk off. And I was like, whoa, 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 guys. No, your battle is on the football field. This is my battle that I needed to fight. But a lot of people did kind of come along your side and help you or did you feel like you was in there i know your wife was was in there with you but what about other people did you have other people within the school or around you uh, besides family maybe yeah. that helped you yeah there was a tons of people everybody in the community all the um the families of my players and uh from previous years we had so much um support it was really incredible to see our entire town and community come together the school everybody it was in really awesome to see the response that that we got and uh, the support that we had all throughout that well with all the support and the people around you there wasn't enough pressure that could be put on the school board to have them reverse their decision yeah that was the part that was really shocking uh, i could not understand that and they were just going by what their legal re- representations uh, kept saying that this could potentially turn into a establishment clause violation and they were afraid of getting sued in the future and i just thought um I, well i actually told them i said hey guys uh, you're talking about a hypothetical lawsuit i i guarantee i will fight this until the end if if you go through with this i guarantee a lawsuit so i tried to work with these guys i tried to get them to see the error of their ways but they just dug in with their lawyers, and I found out that their lawyers are the ones uh, representing almost all of Washington State schools, and they're associated with uh, hate group uh, Freedom From Religious Foundation. Even though you threatened to sue them and they was afraid of getting sued, they still weren't going to back down even though you told them what was going to happen. Exactly. They had every opportunity, and we, even when the lawyers, my, when I got a lawyer, we sent letters to them saying, hey, can we sit down and discuss this? This is all just a big misunderstanding. Um, there's no way that this should be blowing up this big over a 30-second prayer. Yeah. Now, I know coaches are not just coaches in school. They're also many times teachers. And so did this affect anything else you were doing in the school as a teacher where you having problems with other teachers or anything like that, or were they, you know, administration making it really hard on you? Yeah, the administration definitely did. We had so many friends in the school. Uh, and like I said, my wife worked at the school for over a dozen years, and I coached there for eight years. 
so we're talking a long time with these people and you know some some we lost uh, some really i thought were really good friends people kind of drew their battle lines we had a lot of people supporting us but were afraid to come forward and talk to us and approach us they would you know look around and then they'd give us a thumbs up if nobody was looking but nobody would come and talk to us because they were afraid of the repercussions from the school now you mentioned your wife and she was a teacher as well now did she stay and become continue to teach after you were dismissed uh she actually was uh the human resource director for the school district so yeah she stayed for another five years and uh fought that fight um the whole entire time that had to be pretty tough (laughs) because your decision didn't come down and uh, until this past year, and this all started in 2015, so that had to make it a little tough on her, I guess. Maybe staying there that, in the battlefield. That is under, yeah, that was the understatement of the year. Uh, you know, I was born and raised to to be a fighter, and my wife was not. So it was her testimony is so incredible because here here's a woman who gets thrown into the middle of this and didn't want to fight. The only thing she wants to do is get along with everybody. So she had to face her own giants, and um, man, I'm so proud of her what she did. Now, you do talk about your wife, Denise, in the book. How actually, her coming into your life actually was tremendously uh, important in how it changed your life, is what you was talking about in there. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So when we got married, I, I was still a heathen. I was pretty much uh, the guy who thought God was a good fairy tale, you know, a true uh, uh, atheist. And when we got married, uh, we were evenly yoked, and it was uh, starting to affect us. And uh, she grew up in the church, so she knew all about God, and she would get closer to Him, but seemed to pull away from me. And I didn't know how to get, approach her. I didn't know how to knock down the barriers. And I already uh, destroyed two other marriages, and since she was my first love, I wanted her to be my last love, and I wanted the, to this to last forever. And that's when uh, I, I finally had to uh, call on God because I, I had no other way, no other place to turn. Now, in all this that you experienced, uh, how did you stand up for your what you believed in? I mean, you had to take a stance. You knew it was going to cost you when you did. You were willing to pay the cost. But was everybody else in your family pretty much behind you on this at first? Uh, and as it drew out, you know, you know, a lot of times, yeah, we're behind you. <laughs> but then after a little while, after the heat continues, you know, they're ready to kind of let go. Yeah, well, my wife was very much against what I was doing at first, and that lasted for um, almost a year, I would say, where we were at odds and battling that out. Uh, Our kids thought it was cool because we were trending on Facebook and Instagram, and you know how kids are. They they, they just like to see the the popularity of it. But I I don't know if they really uh, understood the magnitude of what was happening with uh, why this was such an important fight for, for America. Well, the book is entitled Average Joe, and it's your story. It's put out by Salem Books. Can you tell us if somebody would want to find out more about the book, what would they do? I mean, where would they go uh, to do this? Yeah, you could go to CoachJoeKennedy.com and get it from there, or you could go to any of your bookstores. Uh, I know Barnes & Noble, Books a Million. There's just about everywhere that books are sold, and if they don't like to shop, they can always go on to Amazon and order the book and get it in a couple days. Stay with us, folks. We'll be back right after this. This is Mark Taylor. If you miss a broadcast of Crosspoint, you can always go to our website at www.kneo.org and click on the programs page. There you can access the current Crosspoint program as well as the last four programs that have been aired. Never miss another Crosspoint program again. Go to www.kneo.org today. Welcome back to Crosspoint. I'm your host, Mark Taylor, and my guest today is Coach Joe Kennedy. Sometimes put out a new book entitled Average Joe, but the story didn't just stop with the book. I guess, Joe, there's a lot of things happening uh, because of your situation that's uh, branched out far beyond just a book, hasn't it? Oh, it sure has. It, it, it's affected uh, just about every American in the right as, as an American and definitely um, affected my life and for the better and really 
had me press into God, and a lot of people got to see God in action over this. Millions of people have been praying about this case for so long that God listened, and, and if we turn our eyes to God, it's amazing what, what He will do with it. Well, what did you think uh, when this really mushroomed into the part where, uh, you know, the Supreme Court gets thousands of requests to hear cases, and they only take 60-some cases, and they took yours. Uh, how did you feel about that when that happened? Well, I, I felt very confident that the Supreme Court was going to take this, because I couldn't see God taking us to the end and not having um, any kind of, uh, of, you know, finality to it. We knew that he was going to write an ending, so I, I just kept believing that the Supreme Court would take it they would overturn what the lower courts ruled, and that we would actually have our real day in court. So the only thing I had was faith, and that's all I could rely on was my faith. So you were having no luck with the courts there in Washington and as they go up through the court system there. Every one of them was pretty much ruling in favor of the school district. Yeah, we were 0-7, and, and it was interesting. The school district changed the story and their narrative just about every time we went to court, depending on which court we went to. And uh, the first court, what they did is um, they didn't want to rule in my favor because uh, the political climate, which I thought was just a travesty for the American justice system, uh, you know, that shouldn't have any bearing. It should be the facts of the case in the Constitution. Then when it went to the district court the ninth, or the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, they, they took a really big stance on it, and they said, um, they even took it further and said that any display of religious display in the public square to have you terminated. So I, I, that's what my biggest fear was, was actually, if that would have stood, I would have take, been the one responsible for taking away all the, all the, um, the rights of Americans and taking away their their freedom of praying. Well, I know First Liberty uh, Institute's the one that picked this up, Kelly Shackerford's group, and they're the ones that defended you. When did they come into the picture? Did you contact them, or did they contact you? It was actually through a third party. It was really incredible. I was getting phone calls from just about everybody under the sun, and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to talk to lawyers. I, I figured I could do this all by myself. Well, um, a friend of a friend, uh, one of the guys I coached with, he, uh, he, he, he went to high school and played football with a guy that is a attorney, and he asked if it would be all right to talk to him. And I, I figured a friend of a friend is always good, so I talked to him, and he said, hey, I, I happen to be at a law conference with these guys from First Liberty Institute, and all they do is religious liberty. Would you be willing to talk to them? And since you know, he's a friend of a friend of a friend. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked, and they picked up the case uh, almost immediately. It, it took them, I think, uh, less than 24 hours to fly up and, and sit down with me. Yeah, well, they, those folks are good people uh, to work with. We've talked to them here before many times, and they're on the air here. And uh, Yeah, you, you had some good people in there fighting for you, knew what they were doing. Now, I'm looking, I think it's Chapter 10 of the book. Uh, it's called uh, Call to Fight, and it says uh, in there, pages 121, 122, that you really never be- intended to become the poster boy for a prayer for religious <laughs> liberty. Then you talked about how your wife suffered working in the school district, and then you said once they found out, you know, she was your wife, that she kind of got targeted, and you said you even had to hate mail, death threats, and endless emails that would crash the system. And then you go on to say on that next page that the school had to hire around-the-clock security to monitor incoming messages and packages because someone once tried to send a bomb in, and then there was constant yeah, emails and stuff. So where did this yeah. come from? Who was doing this kind of stuff? See, that's the thing I, I really never understood. Yeah, I know there's extremes on both sides of every coin, and it I don't know who these people were. I, I never found out because it was an internal vet investigation with the school district and, and law, uh, law enforcement. But there were people on both sides. There was hate mail. There was even hate mail from, you know, I hate to say it, fellow Christians that told my wife that she should burn in hell for not supporting me in this and not putting an end to it. 
So she was getting it from all sides in the school. Was I mean, could you imagine how many emails and calls it takes to crash a, a, a server? I, I, can't, I can't even fathom how, how much that is. Yeah, but they had to have security there because they kept getting death threats. Now, you also talked about in there that one day a woman dressed in a witch costume walked into the district meetings and began to rant and rave, and then there was another time where uh, an atheist group out of Seattle turned up and started blasting you in front of your wife. Man, this had to be pretty tough to handle. Yeah, it was. I, I, I've never had a problem with people being, you know, being confronted. My wife was the one who had a lot of issues with it. I, when I saw them, I, you know, I wanted, I was so upset when um, the witch came over to the uh, uh, the district's board meeting and was yelling and screaming at my wife. I, I thought that was a, a, a line too far um, that they crossed. Uh, when they showed up at the football game, they were dressed in uh, uh, black robes and makeup and had horns. Uh, you, you should Google it. It's it's actually quite comical to look at. It looks like a Halloween picture. And I I thought, man, these guys just these guys need some God in them because yeah. they are absolutely lost. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like the demonic was getting involved in in this. Now, did you yep, continue sir. to coach, or did they immediately remove you from coaching while this was going on? They immediately removed me, so it was halfway through the season, and they put me on administrative leave until I complied with the school district's directives, which I, there was no way I could do. And then they, so they ended up firing you? Is that what happened then after that? Right. At the end of the year, that's been actually something that they've been in contention with from the very beginning. At the end of the year, they took my file, and in great big letters, they put, do not rehire. Now, I don't know if that's technically firing, but I guarantee you will not be there the following year. Yeah. So they ended my career in, in as the coach there in Bremerton. So were these people then showing up at the ball games after you were already gone, carrying on and doing this kind of stuff? Oh, we did, because uh, I kept attending the games. I, I, I couldn't leave my guys out there on the football field alone. So I, I attended every game and sat in the, in the stadium and watched. And, of course, you're going to get some people who try to make us think of it, that I was still there, and it was unfortunate. Yeah, they didn't even want you in the on the premises then. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so through all that st- they you ended up going to the Supreme Court, and how did the Supreme Court rule over these seven courts that ruled against you? Yeah, that was the most amazing thing that they actually took a look at the facts of the case and bounced that off of the Constitution. And for the past fifty years, you know, as you know very well, when we took God out of our schools, there's been a giant decline in our society. And over the past fifty years, there's been a case, uh, the Lemon case, that's been. Um, the one holding up all religious liberty, and so they took a um, they addressed that and took a look at it and overturned that one. Not only overturned it, but really clarified what the First Amendment means with the freedom of speech and the freedom of exer- uh, the, uh, the exercise, where you can um, you know pray in the way that you want or, or you know worship in the way that you want, and the government cannot interact with that. And that was the, the beauty of it. So the Supreme Court ruled six to three and clarified that that those two, the free exercise and the freedom of speech, work together, not opposing like it has been for the past 50 years. Well, Coach, it's all started with you praying on the field. So if you was willing to go this far, why is prayer so important to you? Well, for me, uh, it's it's what is my lifeline to God. I want to be thankful uh, in everything that I do. I spend almost all day talking to God, being thankful for everything, seeing His miracles every single day. And then it seems like every evening I'm asking for forgiveness for screwing up all the things that I did during the day. So, I mean, my personal relationship with God is I'm the one who gave me life and got me through all of this and got me through my entire life. I take a look back, even when I was in the womb, He had His fingerprints on every single piece of my life, and I just didn't realize it until I I, I found Him. And, man, I was never going to turn my back on Him. Okay, so you won this case, and now what What do you think that means for the future of American religious freedom? Do you? I mean, this goes far beyond now just Bremerton High School in Washington. It goes to a lot of schools all over the country because this case would be referred to when other coaches face the same thing. 
Oh, absolutely. Not just coaches. You think about all the people that work in a school district or work for the city, any government entity. That's what this covered. And that's, they said, you know, in the public square, that covers a whole lot of ground. So this really opened the doors wide open. And um, as I like to say, it brought God right back into our schools. So that was the number one thing for me. I thought that was the most amazing. The second thing is that no, there, nobody in America has to worry about uh, being fired for for exercising the rights in, in the worship in whatever way that they seem fit. So I think that's just amazing that we have more freedom now and because of what God did in this case um, than we have in the past 50 years, which is pretty incredible. It kind of reset the clock again back to 50 years ago. Okay, so what I know about First Liberty is they take on these cases with, you know, you know no money, and it has to cost money to go fight through these court systems. You did that, so there had to be money coming from somewhere to do this, and then you went in court, and by you winning in the Supreme Court, did that money have to be recuperated? What did the school district have to do? Did they have to give you your money back for the years you weren't there teaching or pay these expenses? Uh, or did they have to rehire you? What did they do? Yeah, so uh, the only thing I asked for was to have my job back and to be able to pray after a game. I didn't ask for any compensation or anything else. I just wanted to coach football and to know I was right and having my rights given back to me as an American. So those are the only two things that I asked for, and that's what the court granted in the summary judgment. They said, yep, you get those. Uh, I didn't know at the time um, that I, I guess there's a clause in there. If the losing party, we could go after them for um, uh, attorney fees. And so um, my lawyers, they put in for uh, attorney fees. Yeah, talk about a bill. It was originally six about $6.9 million over the past eight years of this. And we ended up settling with the school district for 1.75, and that just goes directly to the attorneys, mostly the ones that are our local attorneys and the ones that took it on pro bono. I don't even know if First Liberty gets any of that because they work off of don- donations and stuff, so I don't know how all that works. In other words, the school could have saved themselves a million and a half dollars if they would have just left this whole thing alone. Oh, yes, absolutely. And not to mention how much it costs them in their attorney fees to represent them and and take on this fight. They could have stopped this at any time. Yeah, and and all the problems that it caused between people, the pressures, the upstirring with the community, all that could have been avoided. Absolutely. But they kept pointing at me like I did something wrong. And, um, well, the Supreme Court ruled I did nothing wrong at all. It was a school district that was in error. So, but the sad thing is they never owned up to it. Even when I went back uh, this, this past year to, when they reinstated me, they never took uh, ownership of, of that. They still kind of pinned it on me saying that I was the one that caused uh, an eight-year distraction for them. And so they had to rehire you. We're going to find out more about that, folks, uh, when we come up with our last segment here. So stay with us, and we'll be back with more right after this. Whatever you're facing, God cares. I've had a number of very overwhelming things in my life. Ultimately, I had to depend on God, and as a result, He helped me through it. 91.7 The Word. I can certainly trust Him. Thank you for listening here to today's broadcast. Uh, We've got a very interesting discussion going on with Joe Kennedy, uh, whose story, Average Joe, has been out all over the country uh, talking about his time at Bremerton High School there in Washington State and the issues he faced for praying on the football field. And, uh, Coach, again, tell people how they can find out more about, you know, the book if they wanted to uh, research it or maybe even make a comment or whatever. How, how do they do that? You got a website or what? Yes, I do. It's I know it's not very original, but it's easy to remember. CoachJoeKennedy.com. Okay, and there they can find the book, information, everything they need to know. Yeah, and it has links to First Liberty and all the uh, the court documents, all the press releases. So everything over the past eight years, you they can anybody could go and do the research on it and read what uh, really happened um, according to the courts and and how they ruled. Yeah, I'm kind of interested before I get into the rehiring part. Here is you had football players. 
and there, when you're in a football coach, there's more than one coach on the field. There's different levels of coaches there. How did that work? Did some of the players, did they stay in touch with you? Did they back you up? Did they encourage you? Did some just kind of go away or some of the coaches? or How, how did that happen? These are the people you work with every day. Right. Now, the coaches, it was really fragmented, and that's what was really sad is that, I, I mean, we worked together for almost a decade, and, I mean, we spend holidays together covering pumpkins and Christmas parties. So when when this started happening, and some of the coaches just could not understand why I was being selfish and was putting this before the team, and there's there's no way you can explain that and in any way, shape, or form. So it would, I'd say it was probably half and half. Half the coaches were really mad. The other half were on my side. But almost all of them, I think I only had one that was really uh, not worried about anything. And he remained going on runs with me, talking with me, and still continuing all the activities. So I lost just about every coach except for one. Yeah. The players, did they still make contact or did the families kind of pull them away from you? No, yeah, I still stay in contact with not just the, the players, but also the families. I've been in contact with their families. We send, uh, you know, the Christmas cards together and Easter cards, and we celebrate uh, birthdays together, and it, it's just awesome to still see how we are all still in contact. I had one of my guys um, uh, a couple years ago that wanted to marry one of my cheerleaders, and he asked if I would come up and perform the wedding. So I flew up to Washington and performed the wedding of uh, one of my football players and one of my cheerleaders. Yeah. Okay, so now the schools had to rehire you. You're back as football coach here on the field, one of the coaches. And uh, how, how did that go? Did they give you a lot of pressure? Uh, was it pretty tough? Did they work with you at all? Uh, how was it after being gone to return to that position? Well, it was exactly as I thought it would be. I knew they weren't going to be happy about it, but I figured we could all be like adults and work through all of this. I showed up in the spring when they reinstated me. That was probably about March or April, and we had uh, our our spring camp uh, for football. So when I got there, I, I flew in. I, I went there the day that they reinstated me. I started filling out all of my paperwork. And then I got hit with all the red tape, and they wanted me to be completely certified even before the season started. So I wasn't allowed to even go on to the football field all during spring break. Um, I did meet with the, the head coach and asked him how he was dealing with everything, and he said he didn't have any choice in this, so we're just going to have to make it work. And it was unfortunate that he got put into the middle of this position. He's been working on this football program for eight years and since since I left, and he's built a really good team in the way that he wants it. Now I'm being thrown into the middle of it. So I went back for the fall camp. Um, first day of fall camp, I got to meet all the other coaches and the, the team for the first time. And we worked out. We did everything together, and um, we got ready for that first game. And so you started coaching. Uh, you spent some time, I don't know how long, you can tell us. And then you decided to not coach anymore as far as there at Bremerton High School. Like I said, I was there for all of fall camp and, and for the first game. But they really didn't want me there. That was obvious. Uh, their newsletter said, you know, kept making reference of, we apologize for the distraction Coach Kennedy is causing. Um, you know, they give me I'm simple little piddly things like they give me a key to to the coach's uh, office but not the key to get into the locker room where it's at and it was it was just one thing after another i every every day i would come home and tell my wife about what happened during the day and she kept the tally of it so i just chalked it up as oh i'm sure it's just a coincidence that they didn't invite me to this meal or you know to this event and when she put it all together, it was like, oh, man, this is, this is pretty sad and petty. But um, the real reason uh, for, for me that actually was leaving was after the first game on it. So our game was Friday night. Monday I went to practice. Tuesday my, my wife and I spent almost all night in prayer talking about, God, where do we go from here? you got to give us something. Um, do I stay for the rest of this year? Do I stay for years, a couple games? And the very next morning, we got a, the CT results back on my father-in-law, who's down in Pensacola, uh, the one reason why we moved to Pensacola in the first place. And uh, 
the test results did not come back good. So it was a clear sign for us and that God was saying, it's okay, you can go. So it was a decision between me, my wife, and God. We didn't tell our lawyers who were really um, still upset with me. Sorry, First Liberty. But this was a decision that, you know, was between the three of us and, and nobody else. Yeah. But you just didn't let it stop there. You've not just moved from that, but you are now using this as a platform, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. If I could spread the news of what your rights are as an American and get a share of what you can and can't do in in a classroom and in the public square, man, it's a great platform for me to be able to share what God is actually doing and to give us a little bit more faith in our justice system and in, in America, that there is things that are happening, you know, not just revivals that you hear here and there. God is actually working really well in our in our society. We just need to embrace it more and start talking about it and all stand up together for it. Yeah. You say in Chapter 13 of the book there that it's titled It's a Freedom Thing, but you say it's really important to me in the course of writing this book about your crazy life that you've finally been able to talk about it and why did you do what you did. Uh, you said, I'm made out to either be religious nut job or some sort of Christian superhero, hero, which was just fine with you. So even though you know you're not perfect, you were willing to go either direction uh, to still see some results from this and uh, to actually get something done. You're kind of like, uh, uh, you know, you're a Marine, so they have the, the deal. You know, you don't want to leave anybody on the field. You know, you want to make sure. And you were going to make sure you didn't leave nothing out there. You were going to take care and, uh, of the whole situation from beginning to the end. Amen. You said that perfectly. Your life's shaking changes. What Are you back to, to schoolwork, coaching, anything like that? Or what has this springboarded you to be able to do? Yeah. So right now I, I feel like I'm in, uh, in in transition. I'm really asking God, what, what do you want me to do next? Since he was with me all of this time and answered all of our prayers and won this case for us, I really want to keep serving, and I don't know what that capacity looks like. I know that my wife and I are going to attend um, uh, a university, um, a seminary this this coming spring, so we could get our doctorate. And if God calls us into ministry or just to keep fighting for people's rights, uh, I, I'm, I'm just willing to serve wherever God is calling me to go. So do you think you would coach again if you had the opportunity? If God calls me to do that, I, I probably would. Um, I think he's given me a little bit of a break from that because this was such a long fight. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would like to have just some peace in our life before I, I get thrown back into the mix because you know very well that, like you said, coaches are, are much more than a coach. And I spend almost all of my time with these guys, uh, helping them become better young men. You know, from this, I, I'm sure you've been able to mentor people in a different way than normally you would have as just a coach at a high school uh, if this had just continued on with your life like it was. Uh, this is kind of giving you opportunity to have another look at how you actually affect people's lives in a more uh, bigger way, I guess, a larger way. Yeah, and that's the crazy part about it is, you know, and just because, I mean, you read the, the title of my book and you read it, so you, you know, I am really just the average guy. I, most of the time I think I'm a little below average. And, you know, if I can inspire somebody or help somebody in any way, shape, or form, I feel like I did my job and I'm doing my job. Because, I mean, we're here on this earth to to, you know, have dominion over it. Well, I don't think we've been very good stewards of it. And what we've done to America is kind of sad right now. And it's so divided and so broken. So I, I will use every bit of this. I, I don't like to be known as a praying coach. I just wanted to be known as a, a, a decent coach. So whatever label people put on me, I'm, the only one I'm concerned about is what God looks at me at the end of the day. Well, it was sure tough on you and your family and what you had to go through. But if you were given the opportunity, would you start? Would you do it again? Would you change anything? How would Absolutely. you handle it? You'd... I, I would do everything again. Uh, I would like to think that I could change some things and talk to the school district so we didn't have to go through all of this to begin with. If we could have sat down and let my lawyers uh, that are constitutional experts explain to the educator lawyers who are not experts and come to a mutual understanding. I, I think we could have worked through all of it, but 
God had bigger plans in the school district. You know, there's always a battle going on that we don't see, and that was very evident with this. Yeah, and I, you just mentioned there's a battle going on. When there's there's people out there right now that are fighting battles, maybe not in a similar situation, but maybe so. And uh, there's Christians out there that are trying to stand up for what's right in the workplace and other places. What do you want to say to them? What do you want to tell them from what you've learned? Yeah, really simple, um, because I'm a pretty simple guy, and it it comes down to you're an American and you're a Christian. It's not a spectator sport, so you need to get involved and you need to get your butt off the the bench and start playing in the game. I will be more than happy to help coach anybody do that, and anyone can reach out to me at any time. Hopefully the book will inspire some people and say, well, if this guy could do this and God could use him in this way imagine what he could do with all of us so I'm really hopeful that people will be really inspired and and really start taking a more active stand in their in their families in their churches in their communities in their schools I would love to see us take uh, America back because we're the ones that are supposed to be governing it so with all this that's happened you're telling me now that you would or are maybe going on the road, willing to go on the road and to speak, and people ask you to, and uh, try to let other people know uh, what happened and what they can do? Absolutely. I I will do that uh, for the rest of my days. Well, in the back of the book, you say, right at the end, you say, looking back on my crazy life, it just goes to show that God can use any willing vessel, no matter how average that person may be. You know, you call the book Average Joe, but... This wasn't an average situation. It is one that we hear a lot about in, you know, some some similarities. But it does go to show it doesn't matter who you are, football coach or just somebody, a janitor at the school, I guess. It doesn't matter when you're faced with something, you're going to have to make a decision, aren't you? Absolutely. That was so well put. So where do you go from here now? Are you, uh, you know, I know you're in a whole other part of the country, of course. It's a big change from, you know, the Pacific Northwest to down there in, in Florida, and you'd see in the sun a little bit more than you would up <laughs> up in Washington, <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, That is for sure. Yeah, so uh, are you, uh, you know, I know you're going to take some time to rest and stuff, but are you ever going to take a rest from this? Do you see that this is something that now God's put into your life and he's asking you to take what's happened over these last few years of your life and to do something for him uh, and he's going to do something again and more of an average Joe than you really thought oh yeah I don't think he's done with me yet I, I figure I'll know when he's done with me when uh, I stop breathing and until that moment I want to use every ounce of my life and use up every single bit of it whatever that includes and it doesn't hurt to be in the sun in, in Florida let me tell you yeah, yeah, that that that's for sure. So again, coach, before you leave us here, tell people how they can get a hold of you, how they can find out more about this book. You said that you would reach out to people or somebody could reach out to you, you know, I guess if they they were going through some similar situation. So how do people do that? Absolutely. If you go to coachjoekennedy.com, there's links to everything, my Facebook, uh to Instagram, you can email me from there. Uh, it just this anybody can reach out at any time you could look at all the case documents you could read all the stories that have happened over the past eight years uh you could find where the books at you could even find shirts that that say um that say take a knee make a stand and if you want to you know support that so yeah coach joe well coach we sure appreciate you taking the time to be with us here on cross point today thank you so much and god's blessings in the future you too keep finding a good fight brother Well, great interview today with Coach. He was on the road and traveling, a little noisy at times, but it still was a great interview to be able to hear how God used a man. And he put out his book here, tells his life story. And, hey, it's all about this other book in my other hand, the Holy Bible that I hold. Joe's life story actually came because of what he knew of God's Word and how God's Word had affected his life as a 14-year-old boy, and he grew up from there. And it's the same for you folks. The Bible, of course, uh, very inspired words of God helps us all if we'll just learn how to follow those words. They're, They're never outdated. And they help direct us every day of their life. The Bible contains the most important words you're ever going to read and certainly ever follow. Be sure and join us again next time as we again discuss issues that are affecting the church. Have a great week and allow God to use you for His purposes so that greater things can be done. Make your life count in God's plans for eternity. I'm Mark Taylor. 
Crosspoint is a program produced in Studio 101 at KNAO Radio. Not all of the views on Crosspoint reflect those of the management or staff of KNAO. You may contact the Crosspoint program at 10827 Highway 86 East, Neosho, Missouri, 64850, or by email, crosspoint at kneo.org. You can hear Crosspoint four times a week, Saturday morning at 1, Saturday afternoon at 2, Saturday evening at 9, and Sunday evening at 7. You can also listen anytime online at kneo.org. Harper's Kennel of Stella, Missouri is proud to be sponsoring this portion of broadcasting on KNEO. Owned by Judy and Danny Harper, Harper's Kennel of Stella, Missouri specializes in French Bulldogs. For more information, the phone number is 417-628-3083.